Jack, I can certainly sympathise with hearing a regulatory lawyer saying this is never going to end. Um, next, we have uh, the only man to decide not to use PowerPoint today is uh, David Sweeney. So, <laughs> David, you could. Could know how to. <laughs> no, no comment there. But she's seen me try before, so she has a bit. Besides, they don't go along very well with my attention span, as anybody who's watched me type of the presentation knows. Uh, as a lawyer, uh, I look at a lot of these things and, and think in terms of precedent, you know, what's happened elsewhere. And having been involved for over 30 years of trying to, um, uh, to regulate tobacco products, deal with nicotine, to say, what are we doing? Are we getting it right? And uh, what are the examples we can use from history? What are the, uh, the other things that have happened? So, we ended up with this really weird uh, situation where things like cigarettes were very lightly regulated. Alternatives to cigarettes tended to be quite heavily regulated. And you, you think, well, what are you actually trying to achieve? You know, what's the goal? And I think in any, any area of intelligent regulation, you, you start from where you're trying to get. I, and if you're dealing with an issue of public health, then clearly the goal should be you're, you're trying to <coughs> reduce death, injury, and disease. If you're doing that, why on earth would we say that cigarettes you know, can largely get away with being whatever they were, but alternative products like nicotine replacement products or snus will either ban those things or will heavily regulate those things in order to protect the public? Well, you know, are you protecting the public? Are you putting them at greater risk because of the sorts of things that they're using? So it's like saying, you know, we'll, we'll go to a, a land where people get around on very high-powered motorcycles with faulty brakes and bald tires without helmets. And we'll make sure that if anybody tries to introduce Volvos, that we either ban them or we very, very heavily regulate them because we need to protect people because Volvos aren't safe. Uh, so is this something unusual or, I mean, is, is what we're dealing with with tobacco and nicotine, is this something that, that we've seen for a long time? And, and you look at the history of regulation, and of course, nothing arrives regulated. You know, we've had to decide what do we do with things like water standards, you know, to deal with issues like cholera. We, we've had to deal with uh, medical procedures. You know, what do you do that uh, so doctors actually are more likely to, to make you healthier than, than to kill you, which is actually a fairly recent uh, <laughs> event for uh, for, for medicine. Um, and when we we look at this, trying to decide what the goal is. I think there, there's this sort of knee-jerk response whenever we have something new come onto the horizon of people saying, oh my goodness, something bad might happen, we better stop it. And it's not just with things like uh, drugs or automobiles or industrial machinery or alcohol. It's you know, anything that comes forward. In the uh, 1890s, as uh, bicycles, uh, as, as we know them now, the so-called safety bicycles became available, there was an outcry. I mean, th these things can cause all sorts of awful things to happen. And there was a, a moralistic response of you need, you need to stop this. And you need to stop it because, well, imagine if a couple is courting and they have bicycles. They could get out of sight of the chaperone. Imagine what would happen to their reputation. Or imagine if a woman decided to ride a bicycle, she might wear bloomers. Some places pass laws against that, including Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, because, I mean, th th think of what might happen. Uh, what if a gentleman were riding a bicycle? And of course, if a gentleman sees a lady when he's passing on the street, a gentleman should tip his hat. But if he's riding a bicycle and he tips his hat, he could fall off the bicycle. But if he doesn't tip his hat, he's giving a social indication he does not consider her to be a lady. Well, imagine, I mean, how do you deal with this? Well, you have to ban bicycles. Uh, and eventually, you know, we get around some of the, these issues, and, and some of them last a long time. So if we look at food regulation, uh, the U.S. is a really good example of, I, I think, something that we can learn a lot from, that there were manufactured foodstuffs that started becoming quite popular in the 1800s because of urbanization. You know, people were looking for prepared foods because they were no longer living in the land and growing their own food. And there was something called the pure food movement that you know, recognized immediately that, that this, this was a really, really bad thing. And, and you had to stop the manufactured foodstuffs because it caused terrible unintended consequences. Well, like urbanization. You know, if people move to cities, 
all sorts of <coughs> terrible things are going to happen. I mean, they might not go to church. I mean, they, 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 there's all sorts of depraved things that happen in cities. And people should live out in the land and, and breathe clean air and grow their own food and can their own food. And therefore, they had blind opposition to any form of food manufacturing. The problem was urbanization was there to stay, you know, just like uh, nicotine is now. You weren't going to get rid of it. And there was big money being made in manufacturing these products. And the food magnates at the time, people like Thurber, <coughs> could run circles around the uh, pure food movement when they tried to ban manufactured foodstuffs. So it looked like an impasse. Uh, you know, lots of moral outrage, but it you know, really wasn't getting very far. But then as people started paying attention to some of the science to say, you know, some of the, f the things they're doing to food, like adding lead and mercury to candies, it's a really bad idea. Some of the other things that they're doing, it's probably producing pretty healthy food. You know, it's probably a good idea. It'll improve the nutrition of people living in these cities uh, and everywhere else. And as that science developed, and some of the companies started saying, you know, rather than just making money selling crap food, uh, you know, that gives people botulism, et cetera, maybe we could make more money making food and sanitary facilities. And, and hence, they got, some of the manufacturers had an interest and started to coincide with those who were saying, we can make healthier food. And so people like Thurber went from saying, I will oppose anything these people do, to saying, this germ theory stuff actually seems to make some sense, and I think I can make some money off it. I need to work with these people. And, and that started to cause the, the revolution that allowed the Pure Food and Drugs Act of uh, 1906 to happen. Because people would come together and say, let's base this on science. What sort of standards do we need in order to do something reasonable? Uh, and we've seen similar things happen with the regulation of uh, medicines, you know, automobiles. Uh, in my country, Canada, we've reduced the death rate in automobile accidents or for automobile use by over 80% since the time I was a teenager. You know, any of us who grew up in uh, rural areas in, in North America can pull out our high school yearbooks and point to the people who died in car accidents. Because you know, there were lots of them. Uh, and it, it, I, I don't think I had a year in high school where I can lose at least one friend in a car accident. And it's really rare now. You know, but what did we do? Well, we, we moved over a period of time to introduce ever safer features into cars and our road design, uh, we made a difference. We did the same thing in industrial machinery. Late 1800s, one out of five workers in North America was injured or killed each year on the job. Uh, this is relatively rare now. We, we did something in terms of the regulation of things like industrial machinery, uh, workplace standards, over a period of time that made a real difference. You know, with alcohol, we got rid of things like Jamaican jake that paralyzed people because of neurotoxin. Uh, made a difference. But in doing any of these things, and I, I think you know, you'll see a consistency with the, uh, uh, the views you're hearing this morning, that nothing was done really, really quickly. I mean, it was done over a period of time because the science, the technology had to develop, our knowledge had to develop. But what do you do with these things? So it, it's one thing to say that uh, the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company, by taking its water below the sewer outlets in the uh, city of London, had a far more dangerous product than the Lambeth Water Company that was taking the water from upstream. Uh, but it takes time to you get to the point of saying, and what other standards are we going to use? Uh, what else are we going to do? How, how do we go further? I mean, how do you go from having lap belts to three-point seat belts to airbags, crumple zones, uh, uh, collapsing steering columns, etc.? You know, why is it uh, when I was about 18, one of my uh, very healthy, very athletic uh, friends, uh, 18, driving home uh, to uh, his farm, missed a bend in the road, went into the ditch, and he died. And five years ago, my mother, at the age of 86, going faster because she did, missed a bend in a road, and didn't just go into the ditch, she took out five guardrails and hit a utility pole before going into the ditch. And she got out and went to dinner because she wasn't, she wasn't bruised, bumped, scraped, because of the safety features of putting the automobiles. That took years but we got there, uh, and you know what a difference because of the sorts of regulations that we're able to bring forward, very pragmatically. In some cases, we we actually achieve a lot by not putting a lot of regulations in place. And a really good example is dealing with stomach cancer, uh, which was the leading cause of cancer death in North America uh, as recently as the 1940s, and is really rare now. And that's largely because of refrigeration. You know, refrigeration came out, and we didn't 
panic and say, oh my gosh, think of all the things that could go wrong. And there were lots of things that could go wrong. I mean, they, they had uh, a Freon that uh, was hurting the ozone layer. They had doors that would not open from the inside. Children would get in refrigerators and they would die when they were playing hide and seek. Uh, some of they were not properly grounded. And you, you get electric shock and you'd be electrocuted by refrigerators. We changed those features over time, but we didn't get in the way of the progress that was being made. And uh, the FDA law in 1938, uh, just like the uh, 1906 Pure Food and Drug Law and uh, uh, US Department of Agricultural Standards on Meatpacking, changed the world, but not by saying, here are these really high standards you have to meet now or you're banned. It was a matter of saying, here are the things that we think you can do, and you don't have to. But if you do, you get to say that you have. You get to say you're FDA approved, or that you meet as USDA inspector. Uh, and what happened is that that gave a huge marketing advantage to the companies that were able to meet those standards, and gave them the ability to, to sell far more product, be far more successful. So it wasn't that we banned the Dr. Graham's pink pills for pale people. Uh, what we did is we said, if you can do something that's actually science-based, you can tell people it's FDA approved. And Dr. Graham's pink pills for pale people couldn't compete with things that were saying, we actually do what we say we do, as, as Jack was talking about. And it's backed up by a reputable agency that, that says, yes, we do. I mean, so what sort of things are you going to get if your kid's feeling ill? Well, you're going to get something that is scientifically uh, uh, validated as, as doing what it is you're trying to accomplish. And, and within 12 years, 90% of all the pharmaceutical products being sold in the United States were products that did not exist before that law came into place. And I think that's another really important lesson that, you know, as, as a Canadian, we talk about going to where the puck's going to be rather than uh, where it is. In regulation, you're dealing with dynamic marketplaces. Things change. New products come out. New ideas. You know, nobody could have known where we would be going with uh, mobile phone technology. I mean, it took off in ways that consumers, entrepreneurs really had an impact on. And this is sort of stuff George Soros talks about with reflexivity, that anything that's going on in a marketplace is very dynamic. You know, whatever you're doing now, you're responding not just to where the market is now, but if you're smart, you're responding to where you think the market will go because of what you're doing now and what a competitor will do because of what you're doing now and what you're going to do because you can foresee what that competitor is doing, et cetera. It's more like a chess game. So it isn't a matter of where the players are now. You're having to figure out where those players are going to be. And regulation has to take that into account. It has to be a living thing. Uh, but again, it's a point that others have made, that you, you have to get an idea of how do you move with this. And if we look at it as how big a hurdle is it uh, for a company to comply, you've got to be careful about what sort of standards you come up with initially. So if we have a said with automobiles, you know, the standard is if you either continue making the sort of crap cars you're making now that kill people, or you do something that reduces the death rate by over 80% next year, you know, we wouldn't have been able to get anywhere. If we decided that we were going to treat um, uh, athletics in a way of saying, well, what we want to do is get people who can do a high jump of over two meters. So starting with 14-year-olds, we'll just set the bar at two meters. Well, we wouldn't have anybody doing high jumping. I mean, where do you set the bar? Can it be something that's attainable? How do you raise the bar over time? If you do that, and so it's, it's, you have something that's optional for products that are already on the market to try to encourage people to, to move to, to new standards, but don't force it because that, that can stymie the market. And then you make the hurdles at a level that people can surmount in order to encourage them to do that. And then you do two really cool things, that you harness the power of entrepreneurs of business to be able to say, I think I can do this, and I think I can do well by doing it. And the power of consumers by saying, we're going to give you enough information that you can make informed decisions about what you're going to do. And we're going to give you the ability to act on it. We're going to make those products available in the marketplace. And that's the sort of stuff that causes the change. That's the sort of thing that ends up with, with products that mean my mother can run into a ditch and take out all those uh, uh, guardrails and utility poles and not get injured. Uh, it's a sort of reason that you, know, you can have a drink after the uh, conference today and not get a neurotoxin. And it's what can we do with a product like nicotine that's being delivered now with a product that will, if the delivery system will kill over half of its long-term users, but the drug itself isn't a particular problem. You know, what could we do to start to change that? 
How do we avoid putting barriers in the way to that progress? How do we maximize the gains that we can have? And I think the lessons are there for a whole lot of other products. And it's a question of can we follow that? Can, can we come up with something that, that sensibly gets us to the goal that we have in mind in terms of public health and gets us there as quickly as we can? Thank you.